Hi there, I'm Beth with 50 Plus Beauty and I'm going to just get totally real with you today. Um, basically in this video, and I've mentioned the fact that I have not had a drink of alcohol, wine, margaritas, or any kind of alcohol in almost 21 years. And I'm very, very proud of that. My sobriety is something that, that I worked hard for and something that is very important to my life. I don't think I would be here today had I not quit drinking 20 plus years ago. I think it's 21. I, I get mixed up between 20 and 21 years. In this video, I'm going to be sharing my journey through alcohol, through alcoholism, and through being sober for the past 20, 21 years. And it is a wonderful journey, and I literally thank the Lord that I was able to quit drinking because a lot of people really can't. And my heart goes out to them. And if you're a woman who struggles with an alcohol issue, I hope you'll watch my video and just open your heart because there is help. And I am doing this video because that is one of my main goals on this channel, and that is to help someone else, to help another woman. And if there's one woman out there that I can help, this will be worth it. And you know, it's funny, but in the first week of my channel, like three, three years ago, maybe the second week, I went to a conference where a young man spoke who had been in an accident involving alcohol. His car burst into flames and he was hit by a drunk driver and it was really horrible. Going to that conference had prompted me to make a video for all of you about my experience with alcohol and how I was able to overcome that issue. And I showed it to a friend of mine and I was a little bit nervous because I'd only been on YouTube just a few weeks. And she said, Beth, that is just too raw. A lot of people don't understand females who drink, who have a drinking problem. So I would not advise you putting that out there. And so I shelved that video and didn't think about it till maybe about a year ago. And all of a sudden it started gnawing at me again, the idea that my experience could perhaps help someone out there. And if this can help you, that is wonderful. If you want to watch it because you know another woman or another person in your life who has an alcohol issue, please share this video with them because together, hopefully we can help to solve this problem one day at a time. If not to solve it, then to at least help a lot of people overcome the issue. But before I get into telling you about my journey with drinking, I'm going to drink this drink and here it is with the lime in it. I absolutely love it. This is, I guess, my alcohol substitute, at least in the last year or so, and this is sparkling mineral water from Costco. And it's funny, but addictive people, especially people addicted to alcohol, they really like to have a drink in their hand at social functions, and so this is the kind of drink that I now have in my hand whenever I go to a party or something like that. And it really is helpful when everyone else at the party has a real drink in their hand, or at least many people do, to have your non-alcoholic substitute. So that is one tip there. So let me go back to the very beginning, and I'll try to make this as short as possible, but I do want to tell you a little bit of my history with drinking. And that is that I didn't have my first drink until I was probably 16 years old, and I was in high school, and I went to a party, and they had beers. In fact, we were at a party in the park, and there was this area that had all of these pine trees. And so we were back in the pine trees and somebody had a 12 pack of beers. And so they gave me a beer and it was the first time I'd ever had a beer. And I drank only about half of it. And OMG, it was absolutely wonderful. In only half a beer, it was probably a 3-2 beer because that's what we had in Kansas back then if you were less than 18. Well, actually you shouldn't have had it if you were less than 18, but somehow somebody had gotten some 3-2 beer. And I felt fabulous. The minute I got to about the halfway point in that can, all of a sudden I was outgoing, I was funny, I even thought I looked prettier. I was just the life of the party, in my opinion, due to that half of a beer. And if you suffer from an alcohol problem, I have done a lot of research and a lot of study over this over the years, and you are likely to have the reaction that I had to drinking if you have an alcoholic tendency. And that is because, and they've done studies on this, there are two groups of people with regard to alcohol. In the first group, in the part of your brain that is responsible for kind of the party feeling, the good feelings, the endorphins, you know, all of that. And that part of the brain, if you tend to have an alcohol problem, just lights up in the presence of alcohol. You know, you have one drink and all of a sudden that part of your brain is just going party, party. And you really get this wonderful flood of endorphins and all of those wonderful feel good chemicals. And you feel like the life of the party. You feel like you're included and it is a wonderful feeling. Now, for those of you who don't have an alcoholic chemistry, then in the presence of alcohol, 
that part of your brain just kind of goes to sleep. I mean, literally, almost. It doesn't go party, party. It goes, oh, well, I've had enough. I'm tired. Let's go and take a little nap. And so for those of you who don't have an alcoholic issue, who don't have that alcoholic chemistry, then you're going to say to people with a drinking problem, you probably would have said this to me years ago, well, just have one, just moderate. Well, I'm here to tell you that's easy for you to say because your brain you know, knows when enough is enough and you just kind of want to go to sleep. Whereas your neighbor with the alcohol problem, their brain is saying, hey, hey, I feel fantastic. I just want to get the party started. And something about people with an addictive biochemistry that I found really interesting, and I read this book called The Gelnix Disease. I think it was called Gelnix Disease. And it was an MD named Dr. Gelnick who did a lot of research on why people are alcoholic. And what he found is that basically there are two types of people, the alcoholic type and the non-alcoholic type. And at birth, the alcoholic types are born with low serotonin and low dopamine. And basically alcohol kicks serotonin and dopamine up into high gear and helps those people feel normal. Because what serotonin does, it makes you happy, it makes you feel wonderful, it just gives you that wonderful, relaxed kind of feeling. And the dopamine, what it does, it is the inclusion chemical. And basically when you're low on dopamine, you feel like you don't fit in, like you're the odd woman out, like nobody likes you, you feel like you know everybody else is in a great party and you're on the other side of the glass looking in. So low serotonin makes you kind of depressed and low dopamine makes you feel like you don't fit in anywhere, you're just an oddball. And so with that kind of a brain chemistry, when alcohol is introduced to that sort of a person, it kicks up the serotonin and all of a sudden you feel good, you feel happy, that depression is gone. It kicks up the dopamine and all of a sudden you feel like, hey, not only do I fit into this party, I can be the life of the party. And it really does just give you a wonderful high. And I relied on that high for many years. And after my experience at 16 drinking, I didn't really drink too much through the rest of high school because I was a member of the debater theater group and they were pretty much nerds. We were all nerds. And so they just did not do drinking. But when I got to college, all that changed. And all of a sudden at the parties, you know, there was a lot of drinking. And I have to admit, looking back, there were some parties that I drank so much that I don't really remember how I drove home. And back then, they didn't tell you that much about drunk driving. You never really heard about it. And looking back, it's really rather terrifying that I was leaving some of those parties at about midnight, three sheets to the wind. And for me, again, I mentioned, you know, on half a beer, I could feel something. I could have maybe three to four drinks, and I'd never had a blackout. I never did that. And a blackout is where you wake up the next morning and you've forgotten whole chunks of the evening. I never did have that situation, although some alcoholics do. But basically, I would drink to total excess, three or four beers. I would end up throwing up. It was just absolutely not a good experience. But when I was in college, I thought, well, everybody drinks like that. And a lot of people did. There was a lot of binge drinking at parties in college, and I never really thought about it. I drank all through college, but again, I felt like everybody was doing that. And then when I met my husband, I was really, really fortunate because my family was social drinkers all the time growing up at any family event, any party. There was always alcohol. Most people did not get drunk. In fact, I can hardly remember anyone getting drunk, and I didn't either. But I would have a couple of glasses of wine at any kind of a family party, any kind of a party. But I would also kind of pre-drink before I went to the party while I was getting made up. I would go ahead and drink a glass or two of wine sitting on the sink doing my makeup. And I would always call myself the Big Red Lobster because actually after a couple of glasses of wine, my face would usually turn all red. I would start to sweat. You know, usually it was not a good look by the time I got to the party. And then I, you know, would drink a glass or two of wine more. And I will tell you that my main drinks of choice were white wine and margaritas. I loved margaritas. And it was really easy to invite other couples over for a drink. I mean, that's an easy way to entertain, and I used to do that a lot. And obviously, I don't invite people specifically over for drinks anymore. However, I will say in my house now, I do have some wine when drinkers come over. That's absolutely fine. That does not affect me. I'm not tempted by it. And I've got some, what is it, um, Baileys, you know, because a lot of people like Baileys and coffee. And sometimes if we've gone out to dinner, which we haven't done much lately with COVID, but when we were going out to dinner, we'd go out to dinner and come back and I'd make everybody a little bit of Baileys and coffee, something like that. So it does not bother me to have it in the house now. But anyway, going back to what was fortunate for me 
And that was that, although my family was social drinkers and I saw that growing up, I almost didn't think you could have a party without alcohol. Alan's family, his father was a Methodist pastor. And so they never drank. And so I had a wonderful exposure to the fact that you can go to family events and parties and have a good time with no alcohol. And that was a concept that was foreign to me because my family were all social drinkers and nobody in my family got drunk. I don't think anybody in my family actually, in my immediate family, has an alcohol problem. Although I do have an uncle who did, he has passed. And I had one other, a grandfather who had an alcohol problem way back when, although he has passed as well. And so anyway, I got married and my drinking was not out of control. I would just drink at parties. And then I started, maybe in my early 30s or so, I realized that it felt pretty good at the end of a long day at work to come home and have a glass of wine while I was making dinner. So I started doing that and I did that, well, I did that the rest of my drinking career and I did quit drinking when I was 42. But basically what would happen is that I would get home, I would start drinking the glass of wine, and then all of a sudden I would just feel relaxed and you know I wasn't drunk or anything like that but mama would all of a sudden just you know leave the cares of the day behind and it was like relaxing and wonderful and when we were in our 30s I don't know if you remember this but wine was a big deal and it was kind of like a social thing to like wine and to know about wine and I never really knew about it that much and I was not a wine snob because to save money I would have a box of wine in my refrigerator but I did get to the point though that every week I would go buy a new box of wine. That's about how much I was drinking of the wine. And I would go to this liquor store one week and a different liquor store the next week because I didn't want them to realize that I had a problem with drinking. Didn't realize it at the time, but they probably would have appreciated, you know, the alcoholic coming in on a regular basis because that's their regular customer base. But anyway, alcohol really was not giving me any problems up through my probably mid-30s. And it was in my late 30s that things started to change for me, that alcohol started to turn on me. And basically what I mean by that is I started to not like to do almost any social event without alcohol. And to give you an example of how extreme that was, at that point we were involved in a church that had a little Wednesday night prayer group and it was really nice. It was a small church, but we would go and eat dinner together at the church and then we would go into this room and we would pray together. And it got to the point that I didn't want to go to those prayer meetings without having had a glass or two of wine before. And at the time I thought, you know, there is something wrong with this picture. If you have to have a glass of wine to be comfortable with your church friends, there's a problem there but I still did not quit at that point. So I kept up on the drinking and really no one really ever saw me drunk. I mean, they really didn't. I was able to cover it pretty well. You know, I could get a little bit happy and mom's happy, but I was never falling down drunk or anything like that. I mean, maybe every now and then I was, but it was extremely rare. And so then I got up to my 40s and again, I quit when I was about 42. And what helped me to quit when I was 42 is that my life started to get just a little bit out of control. I started to run a little bit off the rails. And one thing about me is I can be pretty extreme and I can overdo things, but at a certain point, God has blessed me usually with the ability to say, hey, I'm looking ahead now and what I see is not pretty. And if I don't quit whatever behavior it is that is destructive, that down the road, I'm going to have major repercussions. And that is what happened when I was around 41 years old. And somehow at about that time, I may have ordered this from somewhere I don't remember, but when I was about 41, I got my hands on an AA big book, which is a wonderful book. And I read that and all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, I understand my feelings about alcohol and I understand my issue with alcohol. I understand that before every party, I think, well, that's the last party I'm going to drink at and then I'll quit the next morning. And then getting to be the next day after the party and not quitting. I understand that sometimes you say things at parties that start to embarrass you and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, the next morning you're horrified by what you said. And that sort of stuff started to happen in my life. I remember Laura and I have had our business for 25 years and we had one employee who was a manager. At that point, we were still a very small company. You know, we're still not large, but we're much larger now than we were then but her name was Jeannie and she was absolutely wonderful. And she was a manager and also just a friend of ours. We had a really good time together. And so every now and then we would go to the bars together downtown, the three of us. And you know, I was married, very happily married for many, many years. But I remember we did that a couple of times 
And in both cases, I started dancing with people, which is fine. I don't have a problem with dancing with people who aren't my husband, although now I would never do that. Now that I don't drink and I'm older, I don't even like bars now. But anyway, I was dancing with, with other men, not my husband, with the girls there. And I was dancing with my hands up in the air and I was flirting with people. And I was looking like the big red lobster. And the next morning I thought, ooh, I'm scaring myself. Who was that person last night? dancing with her arms up in the air. You know, you're a happily married person. You've got two kids at home. What are you doing? And especially the flirting with other people. And I have a thought about people who have an alcohol problem and what alcohol does. Because some people, when they drink, they get mean. And some people, when they drink, they get very flirty. And that was me. And that was my problem. And it's almost like, you know, I don't know. I don't have any real basis to believe this scientifically. But it's almost like the things that we repress about ourselves tend to come out when we lose our inhibitions and start drinking. And for me, what I always keep under wraps is I don't like to flirt with men other than my husband. I just don't. And when I'm sober, I would never do that because I don't want to introduce that into my life, that possibility that somebody would get the wrong idea. But when I drank, that was not the case. All of a sudden, I became Miss Flirty. And, you know, like the next morning, I had a lot of horrification, horrification, that's not a word, but I thought, you know, what was I doing last night? And then I remember just before Christmas of that year, maybe two or three weeks before Christmas, I went to my husband's work party and I can't remember who I was talking to and I can't remember exactly what I said, but I started to say some inappropriate things at the party and the next morning I thought, oh my gosh, did I really say that? I'm so embarrassed. I'm so humiliated. You know, how am I going to fix what I said last night the next time I see that person? And whatever it was that I said, and I won't go into the details of it, but I thought that's going to get around my husband's work and that is not good for him. And I just thought, what is happening to me? So what happened is, again, I had read the AA book and I recognized myself in its pages. And I thought to myself before Christmas, I will quit drinking Christmas Day. I will not have anything to drink on Christmas Day. And if I can't abide by that, if I can't quit, then I will go to an AA meeting in the new year. So basically what happened is Christmas Eve day came and went. And then on Christmas Day at Christmas dinner, I had my glass of wine. And I thought, ooh, you know, Beth, you promised yourself you'd go to AA, but let's try one more time. <laughs> let's wait until New Year's. And let's totally quit drinking. And Beth, I know you can do this. Totally quit drinking on January 1st. You can have something New Year's Eve, but we're going to start the new year outright not drinking. I think it was January 1st of 2009 because I was 42 years old and I'm 63 now. So that was 21 years ago. But anyway, suffice it to say, and you know, I know you're not surprised by this, but I got up on New Year's Day thinking I wasn't going to drink. And by, you know, midnight on New Year's Day, I had drank again. And so I thought, I am going to go to an AA meeting. And at this point, nobody in my life knew I had a problem drinking because I guess I was pretty good at hiding things. But I knew from my experiences before Christmas, you know, at the bar with the girls, acting inappropriately, and at Alan's Christmas party, I knew that pretty soon I wasn't going to be able to hide it and I needed to quit. So what I did was I looked up the AA meeting schedule for here in Wichita, and I chose a meeting that was near me and if you're thinking ever about going to AA, look for a meeting near you because there are many different meetings in our city and the different parts of the city have AA meetings that obviously attract people from that general vicinity. So if you're kind of, you know, maybe you have a lot of doctor and attorney friends and you live in a nice neighborhood, find an AA meeting that is near your neighborhood because then, you know, that strata of people will be there. And in my 21 years of being in the AA program, I went to AA meetings of all type and I came to love all different people of all different levels. But when you first get started, it's kind of helpful to see other people that are similar to yourself if you have a drinking issue. And so I went to what they call the East Side meeting in Wichita. And that was, you know, a lot of different people, but there were some doctors there, some attorneys there, some people that were a little higher, I guess, on the economic scale, not that that matters but that did show me examples of people that I was like that had had a drinking problem and that had quit using the AA program. And about that, I will say that AA is an anonymous program. And so I am not speaking for AA. I'm not urging you to go to AA. I just want to tell you from my own personal experience what worked for me 
and what worked for me was going to AA. And so let me tell you about my first meeting. And basically what I did was I was really kind of embarrassed to go. And so I went to an evening meeting. I remember it was a Sunday night. I think it was January 6th. And I go to the location of the AA meeting there. I drive up, park a little bit far away. I wear a cross because I think, I don't want to think I'm some loose woman. You know, I had to wear my cross. You know, I was really into church at that time. I'm still into church. But I definitely wanted to prove to others that I was not a bad woman, I guess. Because I had this conception of a drinking woman as a bad woman, I guess, at that point years ago. So anyway, I don't tell Alan I'm going. And I go into that meeting. And when I go in there, actually people still smoked at meetings then. They don't smoke at meetings inside now. But there was just one long table there, one long wooden table, and all of these mostly older men sitting there. And basically I came in and I very quietly just listened through the meeting as all of them said, I'm Joe, I'm an alcoholic, and they had some topic for the meeting. But it was so interesting to me because all of those men, I heard their stories and it was like I felt like it was home. I mean, I absolutely, even though we looked different on the outside, I was different looking than they were on the outside. Inside, at our soul core, we were just the same. They were telling stories about how they always slightly felt less than, and when they drank, all of a sudden, they felt like they fit in. They felt like they were a beautiful, more handsome, more wonderful version of themselves, and that they could meet the world in a better way and that that had worked for them for many years and that all of a sudden alcohol turned on them. And that was the point I was almost at is that alcohol was just about to turn on me because I really had gotten to the point that I couldn't go one day without having a glass of wine, at least one. And so I decided I would join the AA program. So I started reading the big book on a daily basis. I started following the 12 steps. And what they said at that meeting was, if you're brand new to the program, you need to do 90 meetings in 90 days. And I would say I did 89 meetings in my first 90 days because I decided that I was going to quit drinking and I was going to do whatever it took to do that. And it was hard at first. I mean, I counted every day, kind of like when I quit smoking when I was 25. You know, every day I got through not smoking was a big deal. And for me, every day I got through without drinking was a huge deal. And the neat thing about the AA program is, and you always hear it's a spiritual program, but honest to God, it is like church. It is the most spiritual program ever. And I won't go into all the details about that, but basically everyone has to develop a relationship with a quote, higher power. And I think that AA principle of allowing everyone to have their own higher power is what makes me very liberal in terms of my religious beliefs. Because I think God is love and that we need to accept people, to love them wherever they are. And if they need to look at a tree as their higher power, that is just fine with me. Whatever it takes in life, I really just feel like it's important to accept people and to love them and to meet them where they live. So, so anyway, getting back to that first AA meeting, after the meeting, everybody kind of talks and it's kind of a nice little fun time. So I stuck around to talk with the gentlemen there and they were all like old enough to be my grandfather, really, they were very old. So I definitely was not flirting. But anyway, they said, you know, are you here because you're like a nurse? Because one thing about AA is that doctors and nurses, they're encouraged to go to at least one AA meeting so they understand the recovery that's offered by AA and how the program works. And I said, no, I'm not a nurse. I need to be here. And then I started coming with my 90 meetings in 90 days. And I waited a few days of going to meetings before I even told Alan about it. And he's like, Beth, why are you going to that program? You don't even have a problem. And I'm like, honey, every single night I have my glass of wine or two. You know, it's gotten to be a little bit of a problem for me and I just want to nip it in the bud. So anyway, fast forward 21 years, here I am, and I am so grateful that one day at a time I have been able to quit drinking because my life would not be the same if I had kept that glass of wine in my hands. I know I would not be here. I would certainly not look very good, and I think one of the reasons my skin is so good is because I don't poison myself with alcohol. And I will say that I did go to AA meetings very religiously for the first 10 years. Not daily AA meetings, but I would go to three to four AA meetings a week for many years. Because once you get a taste of recovery and a taste of really allowing God, in, in my case, I use God as my higher power, 
allowing God to lead and direct you in your life, which is what that whole program is about. To me, AA is a more church-like program even than real church itself. I always got more spiritual direction, I guess, from my AA meetings, although I, I do love church too. Anyway, for the first 10 years, I attended very often, and then I went through a period of maybe seven or eight years where I didn't go that much. And it didn't do me any favors because when you start missing AA meetings and not really following the program, although I never did drink, thank the Lord, I did not drink, spiritually you kind of lose the fruits of the Spirit or the benefits of the program. And you start to get what is called in the program restless, irritable, and discontent. And that is that feeling of, uh, 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 things aren't quite right. And you're getting into other people's business. You're trying to control things. You're dealing with drama in your life continually. And those are all symptoms of being restless, irritable, and discontent. And unfortunately, sometimes alcohol or overspending or overeating or any one of the many addictions that addictive type people can indulge in, any one of those things kind of numbs that restless, irritable, and discontent and makes you think that all is right with the world, but actually it is not. So after maybe seven or eight years, I was maybe 17, 18 years after quitting drinking, I did go back to the program and at least do one meeting a week, which was just really helpful to keep myself on the straight and narrow and to keep myself in the program and practicing good spiritual principles. Well, that was a look at my journey with alcohol and thank the Lord my recovery from my alcoholic drinking problem. And if you think you might have a problem, a good place to start is to get a copy of the big book and you can order that from Amazon. I'll put a link below. And if you recognize yourself in the pages of that book, you might just get your feet wet and try out a local AA program near you. Okay, I guess that's about all I had to share with you, but if you have any questions about drinking problems, recovery, anything like that, no question is too stupid. I would love to hear from you in the comments section below, or if you think you might have a little bit of a problem, I would love to hear that as well. And if you're not a subscriber and you're interested in all things that help us be better in our second half, maybe even including stopping drinking, then I hope you'll subscribe. And when you click that little bell, that just sends you email notifications of my future videos. And if you could share this video with a friend that may have a problem, I would just absolutely love that. Okay, I always like to leave you with a little thought for the day. And I've been reading from these Language of Letting Go cards by Melody Beatty. And I'll go ahead and choose a card. And come on, God, help choose the best card for today. And what is it? Ooh, letting go of panic. Letting go of panic. And in my earlier years, I would have grabbed a glass of wine when I panicked, but I don't do that anymore. Today, I will not be overwhelmed by panic. Panic will take my mind off my goals. It's normal to feel panic, but I simply feel it and let it go. I can get back on track by treading water until I regain my composure. I relax and know that all is well. And the thing that sticks out to me most in this card is the line, it's normal to feel panic, but I simply feel it and let it go. And this goes back to addictive issues. And lately I've been working on my spending. I, you know, I don't charge anything but I've been spending too much money lately. And I may share a video about that with you in the future. I haven't decided yet. I'm taking a video diary of my experience quitting overspending, or at least trying to curtail it. But last night I felt kind of depressed. And that little bit of depression was probably because I was not going to look on ThreadUp. I was not going to look on eBay for the latest thing to buy. And indulging in spending a little money has always perked me up and kind of gotten rid of any of those mild feelings of depression. So just like this card says, last night I didn't go spend money. I just let myself live with the discomfort. And I will say it was uncomfortable. And it was actually my birthday. I was 63 years old yesterday. And so I was just feeling a little bit of depression. It was kind of odd that it was on my birthday. But Alan and I decided not to go out to dinner last night to wait till this weekend. And so I was kind of proud of myself because instead of indulging in anything negative like overspending, I just relaxed, felt the feelings of discomfort, and then let them go. And eventually they did go. And that's something important for us to remember. No matter what we feel tonight, however much discomfort that is, tomorrow morning things usually look brighter. Take care and I'll see you in my next video.